we begin. Um, I will do that now and then once it's ready, I'll let you know when to start. Sorry. Okay, we're now um, live on YouTube. Ira, you can introduce the session. Very good. All right. Well, welcome everybody uh, to session B1. Uh, this is the first of two sessions about astrophysics with Lisa. Uh, we have a number of, of speakers to talk about a couple aspects of uh, Lisa astrophysics. We're going to break this session into two sections. Uh, we have uh, three talks followed by a coffee break, uh, followed by another set of talks. And I should have introduced myself. Uh, my name is Ira Thorpe. I'm a, a scientist at the Goddard Space Flight Center uh, in Greenbelt, Maryland, and I'm going to be chairing this session. Um, I'll ask that people who are interested in asking questions, uh, please put those questions in the chat. Uh, our IT host will also take questions out of the YouTube live stream and move them into the chat. And I'll prompt the speakers to ask those answer those questions at the end of their talks um, uh, by, by reading out the questions in the chat. So without further ado, uh, we're gonna move on to the first talk of our session uh, by Sylvain Marsat about sky localization of massive black hole mergers with Lisa. Uh, take it away, Sylvain. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to give this uh, presentation. Um, we start with a very short introduction. Uh, so uh, massive black holes are of course primary targets for Lisa, the primary candidates for in counterparts. And it's an important question to know what uh, are um, what Lisa's capabilities for the localization for the localization are going to be, both for uh, post-merger signals but also for uh, pre-merger signal in advance of the coalescence. In this work, we used the following tools to address these questions: uh, a mixture of fast fission matrix estimations and Bayesian parameter estimation, uh, and IMA uh, is parameter map parameter bring down waveforms with alliance spins uh, and higher harmonics. We do not include it yet waveforms with precession and eccentricity, nor uh, the realistic uh, aspect of the instruments like gaps, glitches, uh, and the global fits. And if you're interested in this topic, you should also follow the uh, connected talks listed here. First, a reminder about the uh, LISA instrument response that matters a lot for the uh, localization capability. So LISA is moving in the stabling motion um, and so uh, orbiting the Earth, and the response takes the form that is uh, written in the two formulas here. Um, what's important here is that the response has both the time and frequency dependency, time because of the motion of LISA, frequency because of the departure from the long wavelength uh, approximation. In uh, the limit of low frequencies, you go back to the case of two detectors, uh, LIGO type detectors rotated by pi over four from each other and in motion but uh, in general at high frequencies, it's more complicated. For short lift signals, it makes sense to go to the frame of LISA uh, at the time of merger. It simplifies a lot of the structure. If you do this, you can uh, see from the functional form, the response that you have, uh, you can expect degeneracy patterns um, that are essentially reflected uh, with respect to the plane of LISA with eight potential degenerate modes uh, in, the, in the sky localization. Massive black hole binaries, as you know, are. Uh, flagship sources, signals for LISA. They can be extremely loud, as what's illustrated on the left. You have a, a waterfall plot as a function of uh, source frame mass and a rate shift of the synapse to node ratio. You can reach uh, SNRs of uh, 2000. And at these SNRs, everything matter, matter, every detail matters. Uh, in particular, higher harmonics in the signal uh, enrich the structure of the signal. They play a crucial role uh, in breaking degeneracies. Um, and if one should say that most of the transit simulation uh, for now, still missing uh, position eccentricity, which will be important to include in the future. So those results are not uh, say definitive. Um, whenever we say that uh, MPHB signals are very loud, uh, it's worth pointing out, reminding that most of these SNR accumulates in the last hours or directly at coalescence. This is the equivalent of the plot I've just shown, but simply one week prior to merger and two days prior to merger. So the manager itself really um, carries most of the synapse moderation. I'm going to say a word of the tools that we use in this study. So we aim at doing Bayesian analysis, so producing uh, samples from the posterior uh, distribution of the parameters uh, using a likelihood that is simply the square norm of residuals. Uh, and uh, it's important to know that producing samples from the posterior takes 
uh, millions of variations of uh, likelihood to explore a multidimensional parameter space. So a different approximation is available. Can... Fisher matrix, just in short, is a local Gaussian approximation for the log likelihood around the true value of the uh, injected signal. It's, it's, it's meant to work in the highest limit, but it misses the genesis entirely. Uh, it's only a local approximation. But uh, you can also do uh, full parameter estimation, and uh, there are um, various levels uh, of detail of uh, refinement. What we do here is simplify P, which means we know what the injected signal here is. So we do uh, an actual MCMC, but still localize on the value of the source. It still allows us to explore parameter space and degeneracies. Uh, but it's not the full um, uh, the full analysis, and in particular, we uh, do leave aside the global fit aspects where you have to consider correlations with other sources. Um, our tools are in a package called Isabetta. That is, uh, I'm not going to detail the list of features here. Uh, it's just to tell you that this package is available to full members, uh, and we aim at having a completely public release um, at some point in the near future. Okay, so let's move on to uh, our study and the results that we got. So, uh, first, we did um, Fisher matrix based uh, study. So we include major and higher matrix in the waveforms, but we do simply Fisher matrix. Uh, the Fisher matrix simply scales with natural noise ratio, which means it simply scales with luminosity distance of the signal, which means if you compute the uh, uh, Fisher matrix um, at a given reference redshift, you have computed it for all, um, all other redshifts, as long as you keep the redshifted mass fixed. And this is the result that we get. Uh, randomizing over mass ratio, spin orientation, everything but uh, source frame, uh, frame mass. Uh, that is illustrated here at redshift one. You can see there is a large variation due to this um, randomization over, over everything, up to four orders of magnitude variation. So we cannot tell you at this mass and redshift, zero is going to be this. Um, there is going to be this is huge variation. Now, if you translate this, if you scale this with a scenario, you get the following control plot for the sky localization of Lisa in terms of square degrees. Um, usually here, the middle plot is the median, uh, the dashed and the full lines that give you a scale correspond to the 10 square degrees and 0 0.4 square degrees field of views of LSST and, uh, and Athena wide field imaging. And you can see on the left and the right, the 5% best and 5% worst systems are quite extreme with respect to the reference uh, result. Um, what's interesting is to look at what the most um, important uh, parameters uh, in determining this uh, variation. Uh, and we found that this is essentially inclination and latitude in the leader frame. So here you can see on the left, the signature noise ratio, on the right, the sky localization. Um, keeping just uh, taking a reference system 10 to the 6 solar masses of ratio 1 and varying inclination and beta L uh, parameter, this latitude parameter. Um, and you can see on the right that these two parameters together can generate four orders of magnitude variation. Um, and you can see that also the trend goes against the trend for synaptic ratio for the latitude. Right. Uh, you can do the same exercise for the distance determination that enters the uh, say volume error determination, localization of the source. You get the same kind of uh, large uh, dispersion by four dollars of, four dollars of magnitude when you randomize over, over everything. It's important here to note to note that the gravitational wave error uh, is not the only one. Uh, you, if you want to convert distance luminosity to a redshift, you also have to take into account quick cleansing effect uh, and peculiar motion effects. And this is illustrated on the right. And uh, you can see so the different curves correspond to different masses with their spread. And you can see that in a vast part of the parameter space, the weak lensing uh, distance error actually dominates over the lead error. So this is absolutely crucial to, to take into account. Um, you can convert these errors into galaxy counts. So this is done just as an illustration here in a very, very simplistic way. Uh, we just take a simulated catalog, which is has no other cut than a, a mass cut um, in the mass of the galaxy at more than at 10 to the 10 solar masses. We obtain, say, a density, the end the omega, as a function of redshift. We convert our error volumes into these uh, counts of galaxies, and we obtain the result on the right. Um, this is zoomed in, right, uh, only up to redshift two. And you can see that there is a region where we get to order of a few, or order one. Um, 
galaxies, I mean, these massive galaxies in the lidar box. But of course, one will need much more details to be about the content, uh, what these galaxies are and what this really means in terms of identifying the source. We went further and did beyond uh, fission matrix uh, only study. We uh, performed uh, parameter estimation simulations for catalogs, simulated catalogs from some genetic models for three models that kind of bracket the astrophysical uncertainty about the population, Q3D, Q3ND, and Q3. So they are, uh, I'm not going to detail what they are, they just um, bracket our astrophysical uncertainty, say. They are illustrated here uh, in terms of uh, source mass and redshift. And we um, perform this uh, Bayesian parameter estimation that allows us to look for sky degeneracies that the Fisher matrix is unable to capture. So you have illustrated here on the top right examples, you could have one mode, two modes, or eight modes sky degeneracies. And these colored in uh, um, respectively blue, red, and yellow in these uh, catalogs. And you can see that we can locate in parameter space where the degeneracies, sky degeneracies occur. One should also say that if you select, don't select these catalogs for uh, counterpart candidates, you can see about my genetics talk. Um, these modalities uh, are uh, rarer because you kind of pre select for low rate shift uh, EM uh, counterpart candidates. If, um, right, you can uh, do the same exercise as, as before. Um, simply um, converting um, your errors to, so we have scalar errors, but we can have also volume errors that we can uh, convert to galaxy counts. And what's shown here is for these catalogs, the cumulative number of sources for four years for uh, sky area errors values and galaxy count values. Again, the dash in full at the top illustrate um, uh, Athena and SST uh, field of use. And uh, on the bottom, you have the magical number of one. So you can see that we do not expect to have uh, um, in four years, uh, we expect to have less than one source that is actually identified as a sole host. But what's interesting is the region between 1, 10, and 100. What can you do when you have only a few of these hosts in the Lizarra box? Um, Next, I'm going to present a few uh, results about pre-merger analysis this time. So pre-merger analysis um, localization is much more challenging to do with ESA than the post-merger, as I've illustrated with the, simply the level of SNR that you have uh, pre-merger versus post-merger. So for this study, we just focus on um, some golden sources, say, uh, that are extremely favorable at Redshift 1 and one that we Call a platinum source at which is 0.3. Um, so this is the best part of the is a parameter space as it is written on the right. For these sources, if you look at accumulation of SNR with time and um, uncertainty about the time of merger uh, as a function of time, um, you can see that it's easy. So you detect them comfortably in advance, and you can also um, locate the time of coalescence quite comfortably in advance. This is very important for uh, instrumental aspects. We want reserved periods of quiet data uh, when the merger happens. So this is relatively easy to do for these sources. If you look at the sky localization as a function of time, you get uh, these kind of results. Um, and you can see it's quite challenging. Um, we uh, actually did that with both Fisher and MCMC analysis on a reduced set. Uh, there is, again, larger. Uh, Dispersion. So the best sources and the worst sources are very far apart. And you can see that even uh, reaching down to one hour before merger, it's challenging to go uh, below the, um, say, the Athena uh, field of view, uh, except maybe for the platinum source, which I remind you is at, uh, set at Richard 0.3. Um, that's kind of the maximally best source that we allowed ourselves to uh, study. And you can see that there is a big jump in all those plots between the localization that you uh, achieve, uh, say, a few hours before merger, and the one that you achieve um, uh, post merger. But of course, we can ask that's particularly important for the platinum source what happens if you, you have already some localization, say, 10 square degrees one month before this happens. So you could also tile a relatively big um, area in the sky with many observations. And we um, uh, that's uh, something that is uh, currently uh, under investigation. Um, Sylvain, you have about two minutes left. 
All right. Uh, this is my second to last slide. Thank you. Um, and another uh, important aspect uh, also of pre localization is that uh, the analysis and the modalities can be more important. So this is illustrated here with this kind of uh, examples of platinum, gold source, and the heavy source. On the right, you have the localization at Maja. In all these three cases, it's a beautifully Gaussian, well localized uh, uh, system, uh, posterior distribution, say. But um, for all but the very best platinum source, you can have strong degeneracies all the way up to a uh, few hours before Maja. In the case of heavy signals, it's particularly notable that you do not have one but eight positions in the sky. So uh, these degeneracies are present and they are more severe when you do pre-major uh, localization than when you do uh, post-major localization, as I showed before. Right, I'm reaching my uh, conclusions and outlook. So we have explored these localization capabilities or massive black holes. Um, we have seen that massive black hole signals are major dominated. There is a big difference between post-major and uh, pre-major localization. Post-major localization can be indeed very good. Pre-major can be very challenging except for the very best fans. And we have explored uh, where do the degeneracies in sky position uh, occur. And uh, there are, of course, many improvements uh, that we want to have. Uh, in particular, we want more realistic analysis. We want to do the analysis in the presence of superposition of multiple signals. At least that is going to be a well fit. Uh, all I've presented was just a single source. We want realistic noise that are uh, artifacts like gaps and glitches. And it's also going to be important to include more realistic waveforms, including precession and inconsistency in what Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you. I see some, some claps coming. Uh, it, it, it appears um, that there are no questions from YouTube, and I have not seen any questions in the Zoom chat. I'd encourage people to uh, put some in there. And while you're typing away, I have a couple questions. Uh, I'll start with one, which is um, you were looking at the uh, this distribution of sources, and I think you, you showed very clearly how there's a wide variety of capabilities uh, depending upon what the source gives us. And then you, you highlighted these platinum sources. I'm, I'm curious how far out on the on the distribution is that platinum source you know we, we you had a plot of the best five percent sources is it best one percent best you know point one percent right so maybe we can get a sense for this uh it's the best uh uh say you expect less than one of these in uh say in uh in four years I do not have the exact number. Yeah, uh, or, or, or I, 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 another question I had had was on, you, you show these catalogs of 90 years, and while we'd all love for Lisa to run for 90 years, I don't think that's likely. Uh, but I, I imagine that was just to build up the statistics. Um, exactly, exactly. Okay. So, the, uh, so, so the in, that, in that 90 year catalog, I'm, I'm sorry, in that 90 year catalog, how many platinum sources are there? One, five, 10? Uh, a bit less than one. So you basically have, uh, Factor uh, one over twenty-five to apply on uh, on this figure, uh, and uh, already at less than redshift one. Say if you want the best region that is uh, the lightest colored, uh, you don't have twenty-five sources in there. Okay, thank you. When when you point out that these rates are, are quite uncertain, of course, the rates are themselves. Um, uh, but yeah, the platinum is. Uh, is quite optimistic. Pl platinum um, is rare, um, as as the name would imply. Okay, yeah. um, we do have one question, uh, which I'll just read uh, from Karan Jani, and it is: Does Lisa's initial orientation in parentheses how the satellites are placed in the circle impact sky localization? So, for the signals, signals, what what matters most really is uh, um, is the position of the source in the sky of Lisa in the Lisa frame. So you just move to the frame where the one X Y plane is Lisa, and uh, and you get all this structure. And we found that um, that's basically all there, um, all there is. I mean, the uh, the only thing that breaks this degeneracy is the direction of the uh, say the Doppler, uh, main Doppler shift of the machine around the sun. Uh, but um, that's subdominant for for this. So basically, all the structure is um, can be read off if you, if you change variables. To the All right. Yeah. And 
Karan indicates his appreciation for that answer. Well, let's uh, thank Sylvan again, and let me invite our second speaker, uh, Chinmay Gandavikar, to bring up his slides. Hello. Yes, uh, we can hear you. I, I think I'm still yeah. seeing Sylvan's slides. Um, all right. Well, while Chinmai is getting his slides up, it looks like they're on the way. I'll just introduce the talk. This talk is to be on uh, finding unknown black holes using EMRI and IMRI detections. That is an E and an I uh, with Lisa. Uh, so please, whenever you're ready, take it away. All right. Um, great. Uh, so I'm out of it. Yes, you are. Ah, cool. Um, yeah. So firstly, thank you to the organizers for giving me this chance of presenting my work here. And uh, my work, which is titled Finding Unknown Black Holes Using MDs and IMRI Detections in DISA. So this work is in with collaboration with Dr. Jani, my, uh, Dr. Michael Katz, and Professor Kelly Holy Bokenman from Vanderbilt. And uh, yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah. So um, uh, the LDK observations, the LIGO Virgo Kagra observations, have shed light on the black holes of mass that were previously not like we did not know if they existed or not and uh, uh, for example the pis and mass cap and uh, the lower mass cap of about two to five solar masses uh, also lvk has provided a very strong observational constraint on sub solar mass black uh, black holes which are like dark matter candidates and also on uh, light imbhs which is like intermediate mass black holes um However, the ground-based detectors are uh, confined to scenarios where binaries have comparable mass ratio, uh, or I mean, com uh, yeah, the constituents have the comparable mass. So uh, our question is that, can these observations of uh, these higher mass uh, ratio in spirals uh, or higher mass uh, ratio binaries uh, open a window to uh, like a full, to full astrophysical population. So that's the motivation behind our work. Yeah. So since we are talking about these high mass ratio black holes or like these extremes or intermediate mass ratio black holes, we uh, we, we used uh, uh, according, we used the waveform generators accordingly. So we use this fast memory waveforms, which is a part of the uh, BHP toolkit, the black hole perturbation toolkit, which is primarily developed by uh, Dr. Michael Katz from AEI. Um, who actually had a nice talk yesterday in the LDC uh, workshop session. I think he's also presenting right now in a, another parallel session. So yeah, we have primarily based our waveform generation on, uh, on, on that package. Yeah. So here, uh, so to generate a waveform, we would primarily need the initial uh, two, two masses in detector frame, uh, the luminosity distance, the eccentricity, the spin, a spin of the primary black hole, mainly because the spin of the secondary black hole wouldn't be that important if the, I mean, because the plunge is not, um, because, because the secondary black hole is way too small and, and it's, 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 it's not at the first order that that spin would matter. And uh, then we use the initial separate tricks. So that I'll just come to in a moment. And we also use the viewing angle, the polar and the azimuthal viewing angle. The DT, that is the sampling time uh, for the waveform gener uh, generation and the integration time capital T. Um, yeah. So on the right, here we can see uh, that we are generating a waveform for a black hole of uh, about 10, uh, sorry, 10 million solar masses and about 100 solar masses uh, binary, uh, which is at one gigaparsec distance away. And uh, we can see that the waveform generation is happening from in, in positive time, time direction. So that is, we start from an initial separatrix or an initial separation between the two uh, masses and we go ahead till the plunge. The plunge is not modeled here, but uh, 
the main SNR uh, main contribution to the SNR is because of the inspiral. So we are mainly focusing on that. Um, yeah, we are using eccentricity um, because there will be a, the, I mean, when the secondary uh, black hole is like, or the secondary mass is uh, captured by the primary one, uh, it will have some initial velocity. So that could be a reason behind the initial eccentricity and which we are, uh, which we expect it to be around 0.2 or something. So we are using that eccentricity. Um, we are taking uh, initial spin of the primary uh, black hole to be about zero. Uh, I mean, of course the spin will increase with, I mean, the SNR will increase with spin and uh, having, taking spin as zero will be a, um, it will be a conservative choice here. Um, yeah, and this separate trick P naught, that is the initial distance between the black holes before, like let's say four years before the merger uh, is, <clears throat> is, is obtained using a function which is given in the package itself. Yeah. The choice of DT is uh, based on the time period of the last stable orbit. Um, yeah, and and we take a uh, we have a we we take a we take the dt proportional to the uh, time period of the last stable orbit. Now it is not exactly equal to the last uh, time period of the last stable orbit, mainly because uh, there might be some eccentricity, which may not die completely towards the end, and which could cause some uh, difference in uh, um, like dt and the last stable orbit time period. Yeah, and we are, yes, integrating the, all our waveforms are integrated for four years. Um, yeah, which is also the time period, like the projected time period of uh, the LISA machine. Yeah, so here uh, on the right, we have strain on the y-axis and on the x-axis, we have time in years. And uh, we have zoomed in a bit of uh, the same data, uh, which is like a one day data, uh, one, one day strain signal time series, yeah. So after generating the waveforms, um, we would like to move to like converting the time series waveform into frequency domain or frequency series, uh, which we do by uh, normal NumPy uh, FFT. Now, uh, when the NumPy, uh, when, when we perform the FFT, we see that uh, there is this tail which lies behind or at the lower frequency end of our signal. That, um, has been trimmed off later on, but that could be this. This could be an effect of the uh, discrete Fourier transform that we are doing, and uh, yeah, so that is uh, trimmed out, uh, and and the residual or the main signal is then taken forward for SNR calculation. So SNR calculation we are doing as prescribed in uh, Robson et al. The Robson Nielsen Cornish paper. Um, the the method is pretty. Uh, uh, straightforward. We have SNR square uh, as the uh, integration over the ratio of uh, F, uh, like Fourier domain signal uh, squared divided by the uh, PST of the detector. And under root over that would be our SNR. Now, um, now that we have a signal and we have, uh, yeah, now that we have a signal, we want to make sure that it is detectable. So using the threshold uh, SNR of 10, we are able to find the horizon distance or the distance up to which uh, we will be reliably uh, we will reliably see an event and uh, yes so whatever is the luminosity distance of the event that can be used to obtain the cosmological redshift using the planck 15 cosmology and uh, that redshift is then used to convert the masses of the binaries into source frame because uh, as we mentioned before the waveform generator takes the masses as in detector frame. And we want, since we want to do astrophysics on this data, we are converting the same into a uh, source frame. Um, all right, yeah. So this uh, image, yeah. So in uh, in the previous presentation, uh, you might, I mean, uh, we, we, we noticed that there was this uh, one very beautiful uh, image, uh, which showed how the uh, different uh, events or different binaries will show in uh, uh, in different detectors and how um, how emeries and how different modes of emery will show. So here is a very similar plot. Um, the only difference that we have made here 
is that we have actually plotted the uh, emery and emery signals in frequency domain. Um, yeah, so let me just go over the plot once. Uh, on x-axis, we have our frequency, uh, and on y-axis, we have a characteristic strain. Here, we have the uh, PSD of Lisa, and uh, on the higher frequency side, we also show the uh, PSDs, not PSDs, but like, uh, yeah, detector noise for uh, Einstein telescope and ALIGO. Um, yeah, and as mentioned in the previous talk as well, in, in, in the initial phase of the previous talk, um, the massive black hole binaries would be a very strong signal for the uh, for LISA to detect. Uh, however, the relatively lower mass black holes, like uh, like something about in the orders of 10 power two uh, solar masses, uh, if if they are equal, if that was in an equal mass binary, that wouldn't be detectable uh, very significantly in LISA. Uh, only a very initial part of its in, in spiral would be. Now, our, uh, what we want to show with this plot is, um, you might see that uh, even a supermassive black hole of the order of 10 million solar masses, uh, relatively heavy, heavy stellar mass black hole of about 100 solar masses, an intermediate mass black hole of 10 power 5 solar masses, uh, it's, it's a wider range of, solar, of, of black holes in the, uh, yeah, in, in the masses that can be detected using LISA. Uh, if they are a part of Emery or an Emery. Uh, if, or in other words, if they are a part of a higher mass ratio binary. Yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah. So in the previous talk as well, I mean, I, we saw a very beautiful uh, waterfall plot, which was for uh, comparable mass binaries, which can be detected using LISA. Um, and the, the the plot ranges from like up starting from up to hundred solar masses and goes up till about ten power nine solar masses. Uh, here on the on right we show a little glimpse of how an Emery uh, waterfall plot would look like. So on our x-axis we have the total mass of the black hole uh, or the total mass of the primary black hole or the uh, entire Emery. Uh, on y-axis we have the luminosity distance of where the event is uh, event is occurring and the colors are for the SNRs. Um, now you can see that, uh, oh yeah, and we have chosen a moderate eccentricity of 0.2, initial eccentricity of 0.2. Um, yeah, now since we want to like work with the astrophysical, uh, uh, astrophysics of these uh, systems, we do uh, plot only the uh, source frame mass and uh, as the distance increases, we expect the uh, cosmological redshift to increase, which causes the peaks to tilt towards the left, or in other words, just reduce the mass uh, in uh, source frame. Yeah. Chinma, you have about three minutes remaining. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yes. So here is a short uh, image of how we show or of how SNRs are varying with uh, spin and eccentricity, uh, we see that there is a, a total factor of about five from the lowest spin and lowest eccentricity to up to highest spin and highest eccentricity. So to have a conservative uh, SNR uh, uh, estimation, we are using low spin, low eccentricity or, or zero spin and low eccentricity. Um, all right. Now this is our main result. So this is the plot which shows how, uh, uh, this is the plot which is showing uh, the entire uh, parameter space of masses against uh, the horizon distance. So horizon distance is for the SNR of 10 here. And uh, M1, that is the primary mass is uh, ranging from up to 10 power three to 10 power seven, which is uh, four orders of magnitude and uh, the, Secondary mass is from 10 power minus one to 10 power three, again, a four uh, order of magnitude of uh, distribution. And uh, on the, uh, the colors are for the horizon distance. So here we have shown uh, how, how far Andromeda galaxy or how far uh, Virgo cluster and how far our GW190521 is. Um, yeah, so 
which is which is the furthest that we have seen using a gravitational wave signal, I, uh, I believe. Yeah. So we have divided the plot into three sections. One is for uh, IMRIs, that is like uh, 10 power 2 to 10 power 4 solar masses, uh, uh, mass ratio. IMRIs, that is from 10 power 4 to 10 power 6 uh, mass ratio. And extreme, um, extremely, uh, ext like super extreme mass ratios, uh, mass ratio experiments of uh, more than 10 power 6 uh, of mass ratio. Yeah. And this over here, the white patch over here is for the comparable mass binaries, which we cannot, we, which we are not sure if we'll be reliably getting the data uh, signals, I mean, the, yeah, data for using the fast MD waveforms that we are using. So here, um, as of now, the uh, as of now, the black holes that we haven't seen or we haven't expected to observe in the other um, missions are subsolar mass, uh, dark matter candidates kind of black hole. The lower mass, uh, lower gap black holes, that is from two to five solar masses, the PISN gap black holes, uh, and the light IMBHs, uh, light intermediate mass black holes. Yeah. So they, they do show significant uh, detectabilities up to a very far away distance. So to summarize from this plot, uh, we have this table. So if we have a subsolar mass black hole, um, and if, if it is a part of an IMRI, the best detection radius that we can have is about 100 kiloparsecs. And, uh, if, uh, and if, we, if it is a part of an IMRI, it could have a detection radius of up to uh, 350 megaparsecs. Um, on the other hand, if we have like uh, low mass black holes of about five solar masses, we have the detection radius of up to like one gigaparsec. And as a part of IMRI, we would observe them till 14 gigaparsecs. Uh, if if we have PIS and low, uh, lower mass black hole of about 60 uh, M sun uh, solar masses, we'll observe it till 100 gigaparsec if it is a part of an IMRI. And if it is a part of an EMRI, uh, I mean, that is like, yeah, if it is a part of an EMRI, we would observe it till 17 gigaparsecs. Yeah, and if PIS and higher, higher, uh, higher mass PIS and black hole, we would observe it till 180 gigaparsecs in IMRIs and up to 440 gigaparsecs as a part of IMRIs. And if we have the light IMBHs, about, which are about 1,000 like solar masses, uh, we will see them till 100, uh, 10 gigaparsecs in IMRIs and 320 gigaparsecs in IMRIs. Now, it's interesting to see that uh, we are able to observe IMBHs till Z of 27. And uh, yeah, the LVK rates for most of these candidates have been, uh, I mean, have been predicted, and uh, it would be interesting. It would be interesting to uh, integrate that into our study as well. Um, yeah. So here is a brief conclusion. So we have used the state-of-the-art Emory waveform generator, that is fast Emory waveforms, and we discovered that uh, Lisa shows promising potential at detecting almost all the unknown black holes. Uh, maximum detectability of the black holes is seen when they are a part of EMRI or IMRI. Uh, if the primary black hole weighs about 10 power 4 to 10 power 5 solar masses. Um, yeah, the galactic sub uh, galactic subsolar uh, black holes or the primordial, uh, which could be of primordial in nature, are observed if they're like uh, at max up to 100 kiloparsecs, while an optimistic estimate uh, would give us an uh, give us a number of about one gigaparsec, sorry. Uh, if we are looking at a PISN IMBH binary, they are observable between 100 megaparsecs and a PISN SMBH, a supermassive black hole binary, then up to 100 gigaparsec, which is way beyond the uh, currently observed furthest binary of GW190521. Uh, yeah, and if we have an IMBH SMBH, uh, well, we, uh, we they'll be practically across all the observable universe. Yeah, we can observe them using Lisa across the entire uh, observable universe. And uh, yeah, the future uh, work that we are planning is uh, using the LVK rates to estimate the number of uh, uh, similar black hole sources in the region, uh, Lisa band, um, and also create a mock Lisa catalog for such unknown black hole sources. All right. 
Uh, let's thank uh, Chen Mai again. Um, unfortunately, we do not have time to read out any questions uh, so that we can move on to the next speaker, but there are some questions in the chat. Uh, I encourage you, Chen Mai, to go ahead and answer those sure. questions uh, in the chat as the next speaker uh, moves forward. So uh, the next speaker is uh, Sajad Ahmad Bhatt, uh, and I'd like Sajad to please put his uh, slides up. He's going to be speaking on the pre-merger localization of intermediate mass binary black holes in LISA and that astrophysical implication. So it uh, sounds like a nice, uh, nicely related to both of our, our prior talks in uh, this session. A reminder, after this session, we will have a coffee break. All right, take it away, Sajad. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for providing me this opportunity to present my work here. So the title of my talk is Pre-Merger Localization of Intermediate Mass Binary Black Holes in LISA and Astrophysical Implications, wherein I will, uh, I will focus how well we can uh, localize, uh, localize the intermediate mass binary black holes before their merger and what will be um, the astrophysical implications of that. This work is done in collaboration with uh, Pankaj Saidi and KG Arun from Chennai Mathematical Institute. Let me introduce. So the existence of intermediate mass black holes with masses between 10 to the 2 to 10 to the power 4 has been a long-standing puzzle in astronomy. Uh, these black holes present a missing link between the stellar mass black holes and the supermassive black holes. We have enough evidence for the uh, still, both the stellar mass black holes and the supermassive black holes, but we don't have any, uh, uh, till recently we didn't have, uh, I mean, conclusive evidence for the existence of intermediate mass black holes. But recently the detection of uh, the GW1905 to 1 by LIGO Virgo collaboration, uh, uh, which produced a remnant of 150 solar mass, Provides a, provides a cleanest signature for the existence of intermediate mass black holes. Uh, and uh, where, where the formation of uh, this intermediate mass black holes was uh, explained uh, by the, it can be explained uh, by the repeated merger of the uh, component of black holes. Yeah, so the formation and detection of these uh, black holes there are several likely formation channels. Uh, one is the mergers in the dense environments like nuclear star clusters, uh, globular clusters. Uh, and also they can be formed uh, by the direct collapse of gas cloud at higher redshift. Uh, moreover, these uh, black holes are expected to exist at the centers of dwarf galaxies. And LISA is capable of detecting the binary black holes in the mass of 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 7. Uh, solar mass uh, up to a redshift of uh, up to a redshift of shift of around uh, 20 and uh, the intermediate uh, mass black hole is uh, in the range from around 500 to 10 to the power 4 uh, solar mass will inspire in the LISA band and uh, they coalesce in the frequency band of the ground based detectors and this uh, this mass range actually uh, facilitates the multiband detection of uh, these sources now, so, so how, how we can do the multi messenger astronomy with the intermediate mass black holes? So, LISA's orbital motion helps in breaking the degeneracies among the uh, binary parameters and hence facilitates the precise source lo localization. And this precise source localization will help uh, providing early warning to the electromagnetic telescopes like, uh, like LSST and Athena for optimizing their observational strategies. And the joint electromagnetic and and uh, GW observations of these intermediate mass black holes uh, can put stringent constraints on the cosmological parameters as Hubble constant. Uh, even in the absence of magnetic counterpart, um, uh, Hubble constant can be constrained statistically using galaxy catalogs, provided we have large number of uh, or large number of such events. Yeah. So now I will discuss uh, discuss the setup uh, for our uh, analysis. So we use uh, the Taylor F2 waveform model and take LISA's orbital motion into account. And uh, we use the Fisher information matrix to obtain the uh, errors on the binary parameters and our parameter space is shown here. 
uh, why TC5C is the time and phase of collisions, and these two are the uh, mass parameters, and this distance, and these thetas and uh, phi's uh, give the, uh, the position and orientation of the binary and covering card to other signals. We fix uh, the mass ratio to be uh, two is to one and uh, consider sources uh, fixed at a luminosity distance of three giga per sec. And the time of uh, time of in in the least Plotted as a function of uh, before the time left uh, before the merger. Uh, you you can see you can see that for all the uh, for all the four systems. So uh, SNR uh, SNR uh, increases as we move closer to the merger as the system accumulate, accumulates more and more uh, SNR. Uh, and the high mass high mass system is uh, since the luminosity distance is fixed at three giga per sec as I said. The high mass systems have more SNR as compared to the low mass low mass systems. And moreover, if you see in the last month before the merger, uh, the high mass systems are accumulating most of most of the SNR during this period. So, in short, for all the sources, we have a good enough SNR uh, even one month before the merger. I mean, all the SNRs are uh, greater than uh, twenty uh, before one month of the of the merger. So, which validates our Fisher information analysis. Yeah. So, given the good SNR is uh, even one month before the merger, we we have uh, uh, here. I am showing the sticker position and luminosity additions errors on these two as a function of uh, uh, time left before merger. If you see the sticker position, then uh, this position is improving as we move closer to the merger for all the systems. Um, for uh, for the low mass systems, the second resolution is better as compared to the high mass systems because uh, these low mass systems will spend large number of uh, cycles in the um, in the in the frequency band of the laser, and the laser's orbital motion uh, will help in breaking degeneracies among the parameters and hence facilitates the better localization of these sources. And the high mass systems uh, show a sharp uh, improvement in the uh, in the second lo localization, because as as I said, in the SNR plot only, uh, already that uh, these systems accumulate most of the SNR in the in the last period when they are close to the uh, close to the merger. So, uh, apart from the good uh, second second local, if you see uh, for for the one thousand uh, one thousand case, even at uh, around one week before the merger, we have. Uh, around 0.5 square degrees, which is a good uh, localization, and which further improved around 0.4 square degrees uh, at uh, one hour before the merger. Yeah, which uh, which can be helpful in early warning to the electromagnetic telescopes. Um, yeah, so the now the right polar shows the uh, errors in the luminosity distance as a as a function of time left before merger. If you see in this case. Uh, for the high mass systems, um, for the high mass systems, the uh, errors errors in the uh, luminosity distance are better because, uh, as I said in the SNR plot, the uh, SNR for these uh, systems is uh, greater as compared to the low mass systems, and also uh, these uh, high mass systems accumulate most of the SNR in the uh, in in last month before the merger, and that's why they show a sharp improvement in the um, uh, in in the measurement of luminosity distance uh, when we move closer to the merger. So now we have uh, good SNR, good circle localization, and uh, good uh, measurement of the luminosity distance. Apart from that, if you see the uh, time of collisions, so. Uh, here, this plot shows the time of uh, accuracy of the time of uh, collision is uh, as a function of time before the merger. And in this plot, you can see uh, even at uh, around one day before merger, the time of collision can be measured within ten within ten second accuracy. So, which is which is which is extremely good precision 
for uh, for uh, providing early warning telescopes uh, so that they can look for any uh, optical or some other uh, counterpart in some other band yeah so ap apart from this the, uh, in the right part i am showing the polarization resolution as a function of time left before merger <laughs> Uh, this uh, polarization resolution actually shows uh, how well we are able to resolve the orbital angular moment or if there is any jetted, uh, jetted emission from the binary, how well we can resolve that. Uh, and this is, uh, and if you, if you see, if you see around if, uh, one day or uh, I mean one hour before the merger, we are getting uh, polarization resolution between five to 10 uh, square degrees. And in case of lower mass system, that's around uh, around 50, uh, 50 square degrees. Yeah. So uh, in this plot shows the errors in the chop mass and symmetric mass ratio as a function of uh, time before the merger. So in this case, you can see that the chop mass uh, errors in the chop mass for low mass system is uh, very good. Uh, it, even one day before, even one day before the merger, it's around uh, ten to the power minus six. And uh, for the yeah, for low mass systems, it is very good as compared. It's better as compared to the high mass systems because, uh, as I said earlier, low mass systems use radio cycles uh, uh, in the LISA band, and and uh, that will uh, and LISA's orbital motion will uh, reduce the degeneracy and improve the uh, improve the accuracy in the measurement of chop mass. And same thing happens in case of uh, in, in case of the symmetric mass ratio. And we can we can see that uh, at one hour before the merger, we will have for one thousand solar mass, we will have around one percent um, accuracy. Yeah, so these extremely good measurements of the mass measurements, along with the uh, along with uh, possibly along with the spin measurements uh, uh, from laser, can be combined with the ground-based detectors, and and that can help in uh, testing the nature of uh, nature of gravity. Yeah, now I will discuss the astrophysical implications. So now, <clears throat> so so if if the intermediate mass binary black hole merger happens in a gaseous environment. So the interaction of the merger remnant with the ambient gas which made in can produce electromagnetic emission. Uh, and the kicked black hole remnant, uh, it interacts with the unportable un un gas uh, uh, outside and it produces shockers which can lead to the emission of uh, optical, uh, emission in the ultraviolet or optical band. And uh, first, uh, first it uh, interacts with the bound gas around it, and then it comes out of the bound gas, and it interacts with the unportable gas, which is uh, which is outside, and it leads to the uh, BHL accretion as it is dragged by this gas. So, you have about the, three minutes remaining. Yeah, the corresponding luminosity is given by this equation, uh, um, and the detection condition for this is uh, m should be less than m, which is the threshold. Uh, apparent magnitude for the LSST um, and for the best result 1000 solar mass this apparent magnitude at 3 giga per second 13.6 uh, uh, which is very less than as compared to this uh, uh, for the LSST which is 26 and uh, this counterpart can be easily detected with LSST. Similarly uh, we can consider uh, we can consider a generic uh, generic case for the this binary black hole while uh, either both the components or the remnant uh, uh, through accretion can emit x-ray uh, in the x-ray domain uh, then and the, that flux uh, emitted is given by this uh, equation and the flux sensitivity for uh, Athena for a five sigma detection will is given by this uh, while t is the time of integration uh, t is the time of integration and for the best resolved system the required is around uh, around few days uh, yeah, so in in a time uh, integration time of few days, uh, this best resolved system, which is one thousand solar mass, can be detected uh, with Athena, uh, provided we uh, given the good uh, sky localization given by the laser. Yeah, summary. Uh, now I will conclude here. So laser's orbital motion breaks degeneracy among binary parameters, resulting in better parameter estimation. Uh, errors on distance and uh, is around one percent. Low sky localization is 0.5 square degrees. And collision time we are measuring with an accuracy of 10 seconds. And one week 
even one week before merger at one week prior to merger source source localization is for all the sources is within within the field of view of uh, field of view of electromagnetic telescope such as uh, athena and uh, lsst uh, so given this good sky localization we can give early warning to the electromagnetic uh, telescopes and uh, this provides a unique opportunity of exploring the environment and formation of these intermediate mass binary black holes by possible electromagnetic follow up thanks all right. Thank you, Sajad. Um, let's see. So uh, we have a few minutes left for questions before we take our coffee break. I'm scrolling through the chat here because I've been having some uh, uh, sidebar conversations with the IT host to make sure everything's running smoothly. I did have a little bit of an interrupt uh, and couldn't hear Sajad very well for, for just a little bit. But what I understand is that uh, it came through loud and clear on the YouTube. Um, so you can always go back and, and catch that if that happened to you as well. Um, are there any questions for Sajad uh, in the chat? I haven't seen any um, in the chat. There's been a discussion of the previous talk uh, going on a little bit as well. Um, while people are, are uh, coming up with their questions and typing them into the chat, um, I can ask a quick question, which is uh, uh, may maybe a little bit un unfair given that this work is uh, comparatively new to the first talk. But in the first talk, Sylvan showed us how there's a, a a vast difference in the kinds of localizations and such that you come up with depending upon the extrinsic parameters of the system, just how they happen to be oriented uh, to us, how they where they happen to be on the sky. Um, there could be many orders of magnitude difference. Um, do you have a, a, an expectation or a sense as to whether there'll be a similar kind of variation for these sources? Variation due to what, sorry? Uh, well, you have to, so it, if I understand correctly, most of the, the parameters that you are varying are, I guess, what I would call sort of intrinsic parameters. The the masses of the source, their their distance, um, you know, things that that are are um, we're interested in astrophysically, as opposed to uh, kind of nuisance parameters like how the system happens to be oriented on the sky or where it yeah, happens yeah, to be so, on the sky. So, yeah, we have actually. So I, I said in the first uh, when I. Uh, explain the SNR plot. So we are choosing four representative systems, four masses, okay. And for each of the system, we are making 1000 realizations. And, uh, and those uh, on the four angles, those theta phi's, which, uh, which determine the sky or sky position and orientation, those are randomly drawn from a uniform distribution. And right. then we are taking the median values of those. I mean, we are, we are distributing 1000 sources or a sphere at one three years, Giga per sec, and then we are getting uh, dra drawing those angles which determine the sky position or orientation from a uniform distribution. Yes, so I guess the question, um, if I would put it more succinctly, would be the uh, the size of the error bars. You know, how, how representative is the median? What kind of distribution is it? Um, in in Sylvan's case, for the massive black holes, uh, I think he showed pretty convincingly that the the error bars between you know, these thousand realizations uh, between the best localized and the worst localized or the most SNR and the, and the least SNR, even for the same set of parameters uh, can be quite large just because of the random draws on sky position. Yeah, so that's why we are taking these median values around large, uh, I mean, 1000, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, well, it might, it might be worth looking into the statistics because uh, I think it's a, a experience, a common experience in astronomy that these rare sources, you know, perhaps like the first uh, the first gravitational wave detected with uh, LIGO, right? They happen to be a little bit odd, uh, and that makes them bright. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not interesting. In fact, they're often some of the most interesting sources are the the ones that are out in the tails of the distribution. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. For that. Um, okay. Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Again, uh, people can produce questions into the YouTube. Uh, there can be some conversation offline. There can also, uh, you can find the speakers in the conference uh, web portal, uh, get in touch with them, uh, you know, hopefully foster some collaborations and discussions. Uh, we are now going to move to a coffee break. Uh, that coffee break will last for 15 minutes. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to convert everybody's time zone, uh, but it'll be 15 minutes uh, after the top of the hour. Um, and uh, when we return, we have three speakers scheduled. Uh, so far, we've only heard from two of them. Uh, we're still waiting to hear from uh, Pratika Dayal. Uh, so if anybody uh, is, is in touch with him or her, uh, if you could please 
uh, remind them that their session should be starting in about 15 minutes. In the case that uh, Pratika does not arrive in, in time for the next part of the session to start, um, we're going to move up some of the speakers uh, ahead so that we can get started on time. Okay, so either way, we'll uh, return here in 15 minutes, and I believe the Zoom will stay open. Um, people are free to chat here uh, verbally, uh, but whatever you say will end up on the YouTube. All right, I'll, I will be taking my camera off and my microphone muted for a few minutes and then join a few minutes before. So enjoy your coffee or whatever other beverages are appropriate for your time zone. Hi, Roberto. Do you want to try your screen share just now? Yeah. Am I allowed to do that now? Okay. Yes, you can do that just now. Okay. Thank you. One second. Can people see the presentation full screen? Yes, I can see that full screen. Uh, let me just check that it works when keeping a slide. Does it work keeping a slide? Do yes, it does. Do you okay. have a camera for during your presentation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. I will activate the camera. I, okay. Yeah, I don't want to spoil my face now. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> Perfect. <beautiful. laughs> <laughs> right. We'll see you back you. here in fifteen minutes. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Could I try mine as well? Yes, of course you can. Cheers. Uh, I should also say, I Air Lingus lost my bag yesterday, so I'm presenting from a tablet. <laughs> so oh, no. That's a such sketchy. a shame. Yeah, luckily, okay, my, well. clouds, my slides were on the cloud, cloud, though. So Yeah. How did your other talk go? I think, I think it went well. It was fun. <laughs> nice. Yeah. How's this? Great. Yes, I can see your slides full screen. Perfect. Okay, cool. Perfect. Right. See you all back here at quarter past. Thanks.
All right, we have a few minutes left in our break, but I uh, thought I would go ahead and try to welcome people back, especially check that we have our speakers ready to go. And that would be Ro Roberto is going to get started for us, right? I am ready to go, yeah. Okay, that'll be in a, in a few minutes. Yeah. And Tom, you are still online as well. Yep. Great. Sorry, was finding the unmute. Button. Uh, yep. <laughs> no, but I, I'm, I know I've done this long enough that we uh, know to give the appropriate pause to find the mute button. <laughs> and still no sign of our third speaker. At least as I'm scrolling through, unless uh, they've come in with a different different name, which sometimes happens. So that be uh, Pratika Dial. Okay, so then what I would propose we're going to do is uh, we'll go ahead and start off with with Roberto, and then we'll have Tom uh, follow, uh, and then we'll just end the session early. Um, I'll still keep each person to to twenty minutes, and we'll see if there's enough. Um, you know, it, depending on what the questions, if if we you know have extra questions, say for Roberto's talk, or even from some of the uh, talks earlier the before the coffee break, um, if we need to come back to those, we can use some of that extra time to answer the Q and A, um, and then end the session early if needed. Sounds good to me. Cool. Thank you. So we will wait, wait one more minute. And uh, Rona, I'm correct. We're still streaming on YouTube, right? So we're we're ready to go uh, once we hit yes. the. Okay. We are still on YouTube. Okay. Well, I'll so... just I'll, I'll wait to the uh, to quarter after, which is still about a minute. Do you mind if I start sharing? Uh, please go ahead. Uh, I'm not. Uh... To I will share. just stop my share to do that. Thank you. Okay. Can you see my pointer? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and we'll just wait, uh, and I'll I'll reconvene the session and uh, introduce you just here in a moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you like your Lisa Simpson diagram? I must yes. say. <laughs> yeah, we we've been debating what the spacecraft design is going to look like. I like your I like your solution if we can afford <laughs> if we can afford the copyright. Um, all right, it is quarter past the hour. Uh, welcome back to uh, session B one on astrophysics of Lisa. Um, we have a couple talks scheduled for this uh, for this half of the session. Uh, we do have a slight change in the program. Uh, the first speaker is unable to make it, uh, so we're going to push the second and third speakers um, up a notch each uh, and get started with Roberto Cotesta uh, speaking on Bayesian parameter estimation of massive black hole binaries using an in-spiral merger ring down waveform model with higher modes. So, uh, so Roberto, please take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you for the introduction and for let me, letting me present uh, this work at the LISA Symposium. Uh, I am a postdoc at John Hopkins University, and I'm going to discuss this work that I've been doing with uh, my collaborators that I've written here. And as Ida said, I'm talking about uh, Bayesian parameter estimation, massive black holes using inspired imaging down away from models with IR monics. So uh, let me explain a bit the goal of, of the uh, of the study. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that everybody is uh, familiar with this uh, with this plot here. Here we are showing the uh, SNR uh, as a function of uh, total mass and redshift for massive black holes, and the, uh, the basically the color uh, is the SNR of, of the uh, of the system at that uh, total mass and redshift, and and the and and the number on the plot is the, the expected SNR. And what we want to focus on in particular are the system under this magnified lens that have uh, the, that are the golden is a binary, uh, which, which are those with the largest SNRs. Uh, we are interested in those, of course, uh, for several reasons. And we want to understand how well, in particular, we want to understand how well we can measure their masses and spin uh, to constrain the formation scenario. 
and also to understand how how well we can sky localize them for the for multi message follow up and this is uh, also and, and in this case there's some overlap with the other presentation that Simba made before and in fact he is an author of this paper as well um Okay, so let me tell you what's the method that we use to, to do the study. And I apologize for the, uh, the long uh, text in, in, the, in this slide. I, uh, I, I, I'm making sure that this is the only one on this slide with this, all this text. So to do that, uh, we create a set of 4,000 synthetic signals emitted by massive black holes, and we draw them. Uh, so, so in principle, we could have used uh, like a, a population, a, a theory-driven population, but uh, since the, the, there's a lot of uncertainty on the population of massive black holes out there, we prefer to do a more agnostic study and scanning around the parameter space. So we, uh, we pick the parameters of our massive black hole binaries in the most agnostic way we could do. So we choose, the, uh, for example, the, uh, the redshift total mass of the system to be log uniform distributed in the range 10 to the 5, 10 to the 8 solar masses, we pick the uniform distribution for the mass ratio between 0 0.1 and 1. Uh, we consider only aligned, uh, spins aligned with the orbital angular momentum of the binary, and we pick them uniform uh, between uh, the, this uh, component uniform between minus 1 and 1. We draw distance uniform in commoving volume, uh, considering the redshift range 0 0.53, and we uh, restrict ourselves to signal lasting for one year or less in this. Uh, using this population, we perform Bayesian parameter estimation on all the 11 parameters of big radiation wave signal using the code Lisa Beta that Sylvan described in his presentation before. Uh, and we also use uh, uh, the, the wafer model, uh, the inspiral measure in that wafer model, IMR phenomenon HM, that includes the IR, IR modes. And for people who are not familiar with higher modes, just are like a, a, a very short description of higher modes of what higher modes are. So when you decompose the strain in H plus minus H cross, you have this decomposition in, in spin weight spherical harmonics that are this uh, function here. And usually the a common approximation is only use the L equal M uh, equal two uh, to, uh, for, to approximate the signal. Uh, but uh, this is actually not a very good approximation for, uh, for, uh, for most many signals. And so, we, in, uh, and this was known already in the past. And in fact, we are using uh, also modes that are beyond the two-two mode alone. Uh, so the, the 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 idea to this study is to uh, give an update on top of past studies that have that had uh, different approximation. For example, some of them didn't use the full inspiral measuring that waveform. Some of them didn't use Bayesian parameter estimation, but only use Fisher matrix. Some of them only consider a few systems instead of uh, 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 doing a scan on the parameter space. Okay, so let's let's go a bit uh, into the detail of the uh, the, the population, uh, uh, not the population, sorry, the the the, the set of, of binaries we choose. And so here in the left panel, in the left plot, I'm showing the SNR distribution. Of, of this uh, of the massive binary that I'm considering, uh, and I'm I'm showing the total SNR that is the histogram in black, uh, and and you see that the uh, the median SNR for the system is about ten to the three, uh, and this is uh, more or less corresponding to the SNR of the two to mode. You can see that the uh, the blue dash histogram is more or less on top of that. But I also show the SNR continent in the other uh, harmonics, and you can see that they are not negligible. Uh, for, uh, for some of them, they, they have SNR medians of around 10 to the 2. So this means that even if the contribution is subdominant, it's still large enough to be important for, for the signal. On the right panel, I want to show uh, instead the, the effect of the inspiral measuring the waveform on, on the signal, and in particular on the SNR of the signal, this is also in line of what Sylvain discussed before. And, uh, and in this plot, this is a, a, again a plot of, um, of all the binaries. Basically, each point in the, this plot, in this scatter plot, is one of the 4,000 systems we consider. So, as a function of the total mass and the redshift. And the color, the color code is representing the impact of the SNR in the measuring DAO. Uh, over the SNR of the full signal. And I define the measuring down as starting from the frequency that is the frequency of the Schwarzschild disco 
that is uh, this frequency here as it's commonly done in literature. So you can see in this plot that the black points are those for which the, the measuring down is not that important for the, uh, for the full signal. In fact, it's contribution to the scenario is more than 10%. Uh, and, and this is true for binaries around 10 to the five uh, solar masses, but you can see that the more you go to higher solar masses, and in particular starting around 10 to the six solar masses, the more the measure is important. At some point is the dominant part, uh, as you can see in the red dots. Okay, now let's go to, to the results. Uh, I think it's useful to uh, give an introduction to this kind of plots because you will see many of them. So uh, let, let me introduce them. So uh, in, in here I'm showing the uh, uncertainty on the detector frame mass uh, M1Z as a function of Z and MZ, uh, the redshift and the, the shift to the mass. And here uh, in this kind of plots, I will always show the uncertainty in color as a function of the parameter that mostly control that uncertainty. So if you don't see the other parameters here, for example, psi is because this uncertainty on the detector frame mass does not depend much on psi. So uh, in each of these plot, each point again is a, um, a, a binary, one of the 4,000 binaries that we consider, we show, uh, uh, so the color is a two sigma uncertainty, and here uh, you see three colors. I will always use three colors. The red is the best, uh, are the best measured binary that are the most interesting, of course, and the black being the worst uh, measured binary that are the less interesting. So I also have these curves that are to guide the eye and they include 50% of the system inside the color category uh, to, to give a, an understanding. So now let me actually describing what I'm showing in this plot and not in this generic kind of plots. Uh, uh, so um, here, as I said before, I'm describing the uncertainty on the uh, less shifted mass of the primary, and uh, I will only show the primary because the same, exactly the same trend is true also for the secondary. And what I want to you to focus, because I think it's the most interesting stuff, is the the this red region, the region with the red plots, and is where we measure best the mass of the primary uh, with an uncertainty that is smaller than ten to the minus three. And, and this is basically in this region that I uh, say here between two times 10 to the six and two times 10 to the seven solar masses for S is more than 1.5. And, and this is just completely due to the SNR. In fact, if I overplot the, 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 the system for which you have the biggest SNR, they are exactly those. So this is not super interesting, but let's go now to the interesting stuff. So this is the source frame mass, which is the most interesting part for the astrophysicists because this is what they want to know, not the detector frame mass. And namely, this depends not only on Z and MZ that control the signal, but also on the inclination angle. And in fact, uh, because of the redshift dependence, and in fact, I can tell you uh, that actually the trend almost perfectly follow the trend of the uncertainty on the redshift because the redshift is way worse measured compared to the to the uh, detector frame mass. So the the, the uncertainty on, of, on the source frame mass is completely dominated by the uncertainty on the redshift. Uh, again, so here I'm showing the uncertainty for the primary, the, the same is true for the secondary. And uh, again, here I'm showing as a function of MZ, the, uh, the shift to the mass of the system and the redshift, but also the inclination angle, that is the inclination angle at which the observer see the binary uh, in, this, in the source frame. Uh, and with respect to the orbital angular momentum of the binary. Uh, again, uh, there's this, uh, the, 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 the smallest uncertainty that is smaller than 10 to the minus two, is uh, in the MZ Z plane is in the region where you have the largest SNR. Uh, but I want to highlight the other dependence, the dependence on the inclination angle. In fact, you see that you best measure the, uh, the system that are either phase on with cosine iota equal one or phase off with cosine iota equals minus one. And this is also uh, kindly half due to the SNR because of course there the SNR is larger but the, the ratio between the SNR uh, face on and face off is about two. And, but here you change when go, uh, sorry, face on and on is about two, but here you change the uncertainty by one of the magnitude. So it's not only the SNR, but it's also the fact that uh, you, uh, the, the likelihood 
changes more more when you you are closer to face on and face off and that's why there you measure best the parameter uh, let's move on to the spin uh, here i show the uncertainty on the uh, the spin of the primary as a function again of the uh, z and and, z, uh, and the shifted mass and the other two parameters that are important here are the mass ratio and the spin so we have a bigger uh, corner plots uh, Okay, let's start discussing the breaking down this uh, corner plot. So again, we have the effect of the SNR. Uh, this is the, uh, the, 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 the region where the, uh, the spin is best measured. The spin of the primary is best measured, is uh, where it's measured at best than 10 to minus 2, is again the region with the largest SNR. And we knew in, in the MZZ plane. And, and this is uh, expected. Also, uh, uh, also, Roberto, the, you have a, about two minutes just for planning. Yes, yes, thank you. And also, the uh, the SNR is largest uh, when uh, we have largest spins. So uh, basically, you, you we best measure the the spins of the uh, we best measure the spins for when the spins are large. Uh, this is more interesting, and is when we best measure uh, we best measure the spin when the system. Uh, is, is doesn't have comparable mass, but is a way to comparable mass. In fact, you see that you can measure the spin uh, further away uh, at a further away redshift when uh, the more the mass ratio is, is, is more. And this is due to higher harmonics because they are uh, more excited when uh, mass ratio is smaller. And, and so you can measure best the mass ratio and see the mass ratio is correlated with the uh, chi effect. Uh, if you if you can best measure the mass ratio, you can best measure the spin. Uh, I, I, I'm not showing the chi two because the trend is similar. Finally, I want to talk about the sky area. This is stuff that also Silvan has discussed, so I'm gonna be fast. Uh, again, uh, here uh, we have that uh, yes, there is an effect of the uh, the SNR in the MZZ plane. Uh, you can see that the best measured system with an uncertainty of, of smaller than 0 0.1 square degrees uh, when the uh, SNR is largest. But the, the, the most important dependency is what, what Sivan was discussing as well before, the, uh, the declination angle that is defined as here. The declination angle is with respect to the LISA uh, uh, reference system at, at Merger and the inclination of the binary. And in fact, you see that this is a very good predictor of, of how well you can measure the uh, sky position uh, of, of the system. Uh, and yes, I will leave you with the conclusion that basically we updated the Bayesian parameter estimation uncertainty for the golden binaries for uh, all the relevant parameters. And here I'm just leaving the basically the same bounds that I, I said before. And uh, I also want to tell you about some future work that because we are talking, we have been talking about uh, the, 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 the uncertainty I've been talking about are statistic uncertainty that are actually very small, but we do expect that systematic uncertainty are, are gonna be uh, actually very important. And in particular, we want to understand how much uh, the waveform models systematics are gonna be important and how good waveform we need to uh, to not let them be important. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Roberto, and thank you for sticking to time. Uh, we do have time for a couple questions. Uh, I have not seen any questions in the chat yet. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions on the YouTube. Uh, Rona, do you have any questions from the YouTube live stream? So far, no questions, so far, but no. we have viewers on YouTube. So if they do have questions, I can pass them along. Okay. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Uh, actually, well, 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 not quite yet. When can, if you can go back a slide and give people an opportunity to type something and I'm going to ask a question. Yeah. Um, maybe go back this one here. Mm -hmm. So if I could try to understand this, um, you're saying that this, the obviously there's an effect on this uh, i forget what you call it sort of a declination angle in the frame of the detector yeah. uh th there's an snr effect there but you're saying here there's more than just an snr effect it's, it's yes. something to do with the the likelihood surface gets steeper as yes. you as you get um towards those extremes on that angle on the cosine yes. of that angle yeah actually actually uh, if you uh Actually, uh, Sylvan also showed that because uh, the SNR is not largest in this region. Right, it's the other way. 
Yes, yeah. and that, that's exactly true also for the mass ratio, like if for the spins. Like when you look at the uh, measurability of the spin uh, here, right? You don't expect, so actually the mass ratio, the, um, the SNR decreases with larger, uh, with smaller mass ratio. I don't know why this thing is so slow. Uh, yeah, decreases with smaller mass ratio. But uh, uh, on the uh, but since because of this effect, actually you measure best the spin uh, when you have smaller mass ratio, other than the larger, and, and for which this larger mass ratio you have the, the largest SNR. So also in that case, it's like counterintuitive in, in, if you only think about the SNR. Okay, so we do have one question, um, and we'll I'll read this one out, and then we can uh, after you answer this, we'll move over to the next speaker. Uh, it's from a uh, Krishnan, Krishnendu. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you say a bit more about the waveform systematics that you plan to do? Also, do you have a feeling about how the spin precession effects may ch change the conclusions? Uh, okay, so the waveform systematics, uh, yeah, uh, say more. I mean, what I mean, we are just gonna see. Uh, basically, the idea would be to uh, understand which. Uh, so the, the mismatch is the measurement for how well to waveform uh, agrees. And basically we are gonna understand, trying to understand what is the mismatch that we need such that the systematic uncertainties are uh, subdominant with respect to the statistical uncertainty. So we don't want the systematic to be a problem. For the precession, uh, how much will it change? Well, I don't think it will change much for sky location. Maybe it will improve a bit the sky location based on the experience with LIGO. Uh, because apparently precession can improve measuring the inclination angle that can improve uh, also measuring the sky position, I think. Uh, and, 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 and of course, you will have, we will have different results for the chi-1 measurement. Uh, but honestly, I don't know on top of my head how much that will change the chi-1. All right. Thank you. No problem. And uh, Krishnendu, thanks to you as well. All right, uh, so the second talk in this session is uh, was originally scheduled to be the third talk in this session, so we have advanced to the future. Um, and can I ask Tom Wagg to please bring up his uh, slides? Great, okay, we see them. So uh, again, Tom Wagg is gonna speak about legwork, a Python package for computing the evolution and detectability of stellar origin gravitational wave sources with space-based detectors. Uh, whenever you're ready, Tom, uh, please take it away. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to unmute, so I had to switch. <laughs> uh -huh, okay. Uh, how's that? Uh, it's great, I can see it and I can hear you. Perfect. Um, and yeah, apologies in advance that I'm on a tablet, not on a laptop. Air Lingus lost my bag. That's life. Um, so I'll do my best with that. Um, but yeah, very excited to be talking here today. Thank you very much for having me. Um, talking about legwork, uh, this is a Python package I've made with Katie Breivik and Selma's done some supervision as well. Uh, and yeah, so what is it? So the idea is that you can kind of sit back and relax a bit and let us do the legwork for you. Um, so legwork is the LISA Evolution Gravitational Wave Orbit Kit, convoluted acronym as ever. Um, but it's a Python package that can evolve sources in terms of their orbital evolution. It can calculate gravitational wave strains, calculate SNRs, uh, sensitivity curves, and then it visualizes the results as well if you'd like. And it should be super easy to install. All you have to do is pip install legwork. Uh, so hopefully you're now intrigued and I can give you a bit of outline, outline of what we're going to do. So. What I'm going to be talking about is a bit about the motivation behind legwork, why we think it's a good idea for it to exist. <laughs> um, and then once you're all excited about it, we can talk a bit about what it can do, um, some of its capabilities, and in kind of line with that, show some example use cases of just some things you might, you know, have as a demo of things you could do with it. And finally, I'm going to give you a little bit of a sneak peek of legwork online, which is an online interface that I'm very nearly done with, um, which should hopefully make it even easier to do things like this. So, Hi, Tom. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Is your camera intentionally off? Sorry, I, I should have said this. While I'm on the tablet, for some reason, if I share screen, it turns my video off. Don't know why. Couldn't, for, couldn't right. work it out in the other session. Don't worry. Carry on. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. So, motivation. Why do we think this is a good plan? Well, 
there's lots of people who are going to be using something like this. So stellar origin, millihertz, gravitational wave sources have been investigated in the past. You've got, uh, you know, quite a few papers there in kind of past couple of years. But then in more recent years, there's a bunch. Um, so there's a lot of kind of renewed interest in this. And as we get closer and closer to LISA, you can only imagine that this is going to get more. And so lots of people are going to be trying to make exactly the same sort of thing. So we, we think it would be good to kind of have a central thing that everyone would work on. It's an open source package for the whole community. Uh, every single paper that does this right now tries to kind of rederive a lot of the relevant equations. Uh, and this can sometimes lead to mistakes and very, very annoying factors of two, which take very long time to work out. Um, uh, but we've kind of nailed this down and spent a long time thinking about this and hopefully now have it right. And at the very least, it's open and everyone can see it and we can all work on it together. So the idea is that we can have experts collaborating, suggesting features and avoiding doing all of that unnecessary work over and over and over again. And at the same time, what we can do is get newcomers to enter the field very easily and then quickly contribute uh, to, you know, all of the research that we do here. So hopefully now you're excited about like work. Uh, and I can tell you a bit about, you know, exactly what it would do. And before we even get to that, what I want to say is what you should, and perhaps more importantly, shouldn't use legwork for. So all of the equations that we're using in legwork only apply in this post-Newtonian approximation. And it's really quite a low order. It's like about order 0 0.5. Um, and so this is great for stellar origin sources that are still in spiraling, absolutely fine for those. Um, but for supermassive black holes, things like that, that's going to break this approximation. You don't want to be using legwork for that sort of thing. And Legwork is designed for binaries. Uh, it can handle any sort of eccentric binary, that's fine. Um, you can adapt it for triples or higher order systems as long as you know the frequency and eccentricity evolution. Um, but it's not designed for something like a continuous gravitational wave source, which honestly I would not know what to do with. Um, so that's not what Legwork's for. And so there are a lot of equations that go into it, many, many papers, a lot of this, uh, has been kind of derived before and we haven't really done anything new except put it all together in one place and we've checked it really many times and we've confirmed it against this, uh, well, Stas's paper, like the LISA document that uh, like derives the SNR and we've checked that everything confirms with that. So we are happy that it is valid. Um, if you want to read more about the equations, it's in section three of the paper, but I don't think anyone really wants to be reading equations right now. We want to see what it does instead. So what I'm just gonna tell you is a bit about the structure of what the package is. It's built up of seven different modules. I'm just gonna give you a quick map of what they are. So first we've got, you know, your simple utility functions, things like that G and V function we saw before, just the, like the relative power in different harmonics, things like that. Um, and that feeds into more important uh, modules such as the evolution module. Uh, this can do any sort of orbital evolution due to gravitational wave emission. And it can also calculate merger times. And that's fine for circular and eccentric systems to do both of those. And then that evolution can also be used with uh, calculating, well, no, I'll get to that. So it can also calculate gravitational wave strains, both the regular strain amplitude and the characteristic strain amplitude, it'll do both. Uh, and also we've got a module that handles power spectral densities. So all different sensitivity curves from uh, Lisa and Chanchin and custom ones as well. And you can use all of these together uh, to calculate signal to noise ratios. And finally, once you've got all your results, you might want to visualize them. And kind of, we've got lots of plotting routines that make this super easy to put them up on a sensitivity curve and things like that. And what we've then done is basically taken all of these and squished them all together into one Python class. So it makes it very kind of accessible. You don't have to root around for different functions. You can just write something like get SNR and it will do it and handle all of the kind of complicated bits in the background. Um, yeah. So let's just give you a couple of things that you might do with it. I think the most obvious one is just calculate signal to noise ratios of populations of sources. So you can kind of rapidly do this for large populations. It will kind of do different approximations based on whether you can assume it's stationary or assume it's circular. Uh, and it will only use a certain number of harmonics based on what you set the tolerances to be. So it's flexible, but it's as fast as it can be based on your personal choices. Uh, and then once you've calculated all the signal to noise ratios of all your sources, you can then plot them quite easily. So if you want to make a plot like this, where you have a density distribution of your sources, it's just one line of code. Once you've calculated all your signal to noise ratios, you just say plot sources on sensitivity curve and you get something like this. And so you can see we've got a density distribution here with some 
points that are just kind of on the edges because you can't plot the full distribution. It must be messy. And you can see, you know, it's hovering for a couple of millihertz. And those are all of your detectable systems. And you can do something like that nice and easily. On the note of sensitivity curves, you can use lots of different ones. So here you can see we've got lots of different uh, Lisa curves, a Chanchin curve as well. Um, and so hopefully this makes it very convenient. There are an array of different settings. You can change the observation time of the missile. You can change whether you approximate the response function. Uh, you can also then change what detector you're using. Maybe you're using Lisa. Maybe you're thinking maybe these sources are more suited to Chanchin or something like that. And we also let you use a lot of different galactic confusion noise models. So we've got the one from uh, the Robson paper 2019, then also the Huang 2020, and the uh, newer one by Sarah Thiel uh, 2021. Uh, that's actually being presented in parallel session D next, if you want to go take a look at that. Um, and all of these you can use quite easily and quickly. But at the same time, say you've got some uh, power spectral density function or confusion noise function that you want to use and it's not used by everyone else, you can experiment with these and use an entirely custom function if you want, and that should hopefully be very easy to do. If you can write the function in Python, you can then hand it straight to legwork and it will do its magic. <laughs> and then other thing you can do is compute all of the orbital evolution. So what you can do is then use our parallelized precompiled functions and do this nice and quickly and efficiently for your large uh, populations. So what you can see on this plot is a grid of sources that are kind of spaced out in log orbital frequency and eccentricity. And I've just evolved them all for the same amount of time and legwork. I think I did like a million years or something. Uh, and so you can see the ones with low frequency, low eccentricity in the bottom left corner don't really move. And then as you get to higher frequency, higher eccentricity, they evolve more and more. And you get end up with the blue dots, which are the ones that have merged before that time has passed. Uh, and so that's an example of how you could kind of do this orbital evolution. And so let's, talking of examples, uh, see some example use cases of legwork, some things that you might want to do with. So first of all, uh, here's a plot where I tried to calculate some horizon distances. So what I'm talking about with the horizon distance is just the maximum distance at which a source is still detectable. And so what I've done here is got a grid of sources. All of them are circular, just to make my life a little easier uh, with kind of visualizing it. Uh, and on the x-axis, you've got orbital frequency. So on the left, you've got low frequency, things that are far away from merging. On the right, you've got high frequency, things that are closer to merging. And on the y-axis, you've got the chirp mass. So the bottom are low mass things, the top are higher mass things. And note that's a log scale as well. And what all these color contours are showing are those horizon distances. So you can see it starts out at like one parsec that goes all the way up to a gigaparsec. So there's a large range here. And what we've done to try and guide your eye with this is add some typical masses to indicate distances uh, at which these things could be detected. So you've got things like a double white dwarf with 0 0.6 point plus 0 0.6 solar masses, but you've also got like a 10 plus 10 black hole, binary black hole up there. And at the same time, you can see these white contours where you've got uh, some kind of typical galactic distances you might be interested in, like the Milky Way Center or the Andromeda Galaxy or the nearest ground-based gravitational wave source, something like that. Uh, and so you can see, you could use this, for instance, maybe you want to know, okay, at what frequency does my circular double white dwarf need to be in order to be detected in the center of the Milky Way? So it looks like on this, that's about a millihertz. Uh, and you can then kind of play around with this and do more things. And I think the, the one other thing to note on this plot is you can see there's kind of like a, a dramatic moment when you go past uh, the merger time equaling the observation time, everything above and right of that line kind of the distances get much smaller. And that's because it merges before the emission is done. And so you kind of lose a lot of the signal buildup over time. So that's one example use. Uh, perhaps also you'd like to see how the, the SNR of a source will evolve over time. And so what we've done here is taken a source that has uh, uh, equal mass ratio, both 15 solar masses. It's 20 kiloparsecs uh, from us. And what I've got are three panels here showing the evolution of the eccentricity, the orbital frequency, and the signal to noise ratio. Um, and what I'm showing you is how they evolve in the time before merger. So that zero on the far right is the moment at which the binary merges. And then you've got kind of backwards in time in terms of mega years. And so you can see that as time goes on, the eccentricity goes down and it circularizes. The frequency goes up and it goes up dramatically towards the end. And you can see a similar sort of trend with the signal to noise ratio. 
And what you could use this for is perhaps say, uh, at what moment does this source become detectable? So in this case, it looks like about a million years from when it merges, that signal to noise ratio pops above seven. And if we take that as a kind of fiducial detection threshold, that means that's the point at which that source would become detectable. So maybe you could use this to find out when different types of sources, like at what point would they become detectable? How close would they be to merging? Something like that. You have about uh, uh, three minutes left. Perfect. I think I'll be done early then. Um, so one third one is just to, or third and last example, is for comparing different detectors. So say you've got a collection of sources and you don't know which detector you want to kind of focus on, you can maybe see which one would suit you better. And this doesn't have to be Lisa and Chanchin, it could be Lisa and Lisa with some other setting. Um, but what we can do here is take a grid of systems with orbital frequency, again, same way as before, low frequencies on the left, high frequencies on the right. And this time the y-axis is showing you eccentricity. So you can see highly eccentric sources at the top and circular sources at the bottom. Um, what I'm doing here is calculating the signal to noise ratio in both detectors using legwork. Uh, oh, and I should say all of these systems have the same masses, same distances. Um, but and what I'm plotting is the ratio. So the gray dotted line is when they're equal, but you can see that uh, kind of the circular, but kind of millihertz systems are much more detectable in Lisa, like three times more. Whereas Chanchin, if you get high frequency, high eccentricity system, those ones are going to be more detectable because um, it kind of has that flat bottom at the right hand side of that sensitivity curve. And so, yeah, as I'm saying, you can examine your biases in your different detector, and maybe choose which one would be the favorite for your kind of potential population of sources. And so my final little sneak peek um, is for legwork online, which is something I was working on for no particular reason other than I thought it would be fun. Um, and it's an online interface for legwork. So if perhaps you don't want to download a whole Python package, you can use a simple and convenient interface to legwork instead. And so what you can do is kind of do some quick calculations. The more complex analysis, you're still going to need the Python package. It's not quite as flexible because uh, that was hard. This is what you've got. You can input a single source. You can kind of plop in a whole CSV of sources if you just follow our format. Or you can draw random sources from different distributions that we've got in there. Um, and you can use different detector settings as you see, change the tolerances. And then you can do all of the kind of usual legwork things. So you can calculate signal to noise ratios, merger times, strains. Uh, you can evolve your population and make a bunch of plots as well. Um, so all of that is there. And at the same time, you can then download all those results to a CSV straight afterwards. You'll get a big table at the bottom. You can click that download button in the top right. And you can do all of this without ever having to install a Python package. So I'm hoping that I can get this. I mean, it works on my local machine, so it's nearly there. I'm thinking like next two weeks, I'll hopefully be properly publishing it and giving links out everywhere. Um, so watch out for that. So yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, as I said, let us do the legwork for you. And yeah, check out the paper. Pip install it if you want. Documentation is legwork.readthedocs.io. Yeah, thank you for listening. All right, th thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah, it looks, looks very exciting, very user-friendly. Um, let's see, we have a couple of chats, or a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is from um, our IT host, Rona McTeague. Uh, she says, this is amazing, I agree. Uh, is it aimed at researchers or could it also be used in education or training? So I definitely think when I first did it, it was for research. But this online interface in particular, I think, could be useful for education in that way. Because I think if you're going to do a full paper, you're going to want the Python package to get the full flexibility. But if you want to you know, get some people interested and say, what happens if I make the source this much more massive to the signal to noise ratio? I think that online interface could be very useful uh, for kind of education in that way. I'd be excited to see it used that way, definitely. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Okay, a uh, second question from Karan Jani. Uh, great talk. Uh, what are the waveform models that we can use in late work? Uh, so we don't use waveform models because we're <laughs> not that fancy. Um, we are just using uh, just like the, uh, what is it, the stationary wave approximation, which I think, so I don't, I, so Karan, you clearly understand all of this far more than I do, but essentially we're just using the equations that you'd find in Stas's uh, document it, so this is only for like the uh, what are the, the lower frequency sources, um, and I honestly don't know too much about waveforms, which is why my answer perhaps sounds a bit rambly. Uh, but hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Karan, feel free to to jump in if you if you wanted to follow up. Oh, this is great, Tom, and uh, I think maybe we can take it offline. You know, this is a great. 
tool already and maybe we can extend it for other purposes as well. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'd be and, and very I, happy to talk more. Uh, maybe just as a, a, a final question here um, is about the, just sort of, I see you had the link there. Um, are some of the examples that you showed, are, do you have those available as, is that included if you download the package as a you know Jupyter notebook or, or however uh, you did those? Yes, they are all, you can see this, right? Yes. So if you just go to legwork.readthedocs.io, okay. you'll see this. And we have a series of tutorials of various different things you might want to do and also demos. So I, you, for my presentation, I stole a lot of them from here. Right. Like the comparing sensitivity curve ones here as well. All of the right. code is there for you to copy. A little copy button appears on the top right. Uh, so yeah, right. it's all I'm, out there. I'm familiar with this this interface. This is a great uh, a great interface for that kind of a you know not not quite power user, but which makes makes it a little bit easier. Okay, yeah, it's surprisingly easy to set up. <laughs> yeah. Um, hi, I hi will... there's one more question from yes, YouTube. I, 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 you. I see that. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, so this is from a YouTube user, and it is the SNR computed using sky average sensitivity, or is the actual sky location and detector motion or orientation included? Yeah, great question. Um, it's sky averaged mainly. Uh, so you can do fully eccentric and fully evolving or chirping sources, however you want to say it, uh, for all of the sky average. Um, for the position specific, we only have it implemented for circular and stationary sources. Um, so if your source is evolving or if it's eccentric, no. But if it is circular and stationary, yes, you can also put in the positions just using an AstroPy sky coord object. So yeah, and inclinations and polarizations too. Very good. Okay, so uh, before we adjourn, uh, since we uh, only have two of our three speakers for this session, um, I'll give people an opportunity to ask questions to any of the speakers. I believe we have our, our speakers still present from the um, first half of the session as well. Um, and then if I'll give people a few moments to, to put a question in the chat or raise their hand. Okay, well, I don't see any further questions. I think that's because the talks were all very clear. Um, and that will conclude this session. And I hope, I think that also concludes the symposium for, for the day, at least this track of it. And I hope everybody is having a good time and learning a lot, uh, meeting some new people, and will continue to do so the rest of the week. Uh, so thanks again to all the speakers. Uh, thank you to our host. Um, and thank you to all the organizers of the conference for uh, putting this together. And we will see you during the rest of the week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ira. Bye, everyone.